Hey, it's time for our third study in the book of Jonah. I hope you're staying up with us. hope you're reading these chapters, uh, spending uh, uh, the week prior just meditating on these passages and maybe doing a little research on your own. There's plenty of online research resources as well as commentaries that most of you are familiar with. But uh, if you look in Jonah chapter 3, uh, the Jonah chapter 3 guy and Jonah chapter 1 guy are obviously two different guys. Yes, it's the same man, but he's not the same person. God has done something in his life. God's worked with grace in his life. God's answered his prayer in his life. In fact, Jonah chapter 2 ended up with that verse 10, and the Lord commanded the fish, uh, and it v vomited Jonah up on dry land. That's a little different because in Jonah chapter 1 and chapter 2, you see Jonah going down to Joppa. You see Jonah going down into the ship. You see Jonah going down into the belly of the well. You see Jonah going down into the deep. Uh, folks, by the way, anytime you're running from the Lord, it's always down, down, down. We fall down. We don't fall up. And so if you're hoping that somehow things will get better if you just ignore what the Lord's saying or you run from what God is saying to you, I'm sorry to say there's no up in any of that. It's always down, down, down. It may look like you're taking a step up, but if it's a step away, it's always falling down. So here you see Jonah now. He's vomited up, so he's got the first action in the right way. And then there's that verse that says, And the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go into Nineveh, the great city, and preach unto it according to... Uh, unto it, the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arises. He goes to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. And Nineveh was an exceeding great city, a three days journey. Uh, when it talks about a city, uh, uh, exceeding great city, that's an interesting phrase in, in the, the Hebrew when it brings it out. Uh, it's a, literally translated city that's great to God. And I think that uh, it's great be to God because like any one of us, we're great to God, whether we realize it or not, because God loves us. That's what makes it great. When God ever speaks to us and God gives us a word from his word, I mean, we should realize the beauty of that and the glory of that, that God loves me enough to speak to me, to convict me, to draw me, and to minister to me. I think uh, most of us have a lower estimation of ourselves and what God really has. I know we see ourselves and we're constantly looking at ourselves in comparison to the Word of God, and we see the faults and the failures. Uh, praise God for the blood of Jesus, where he sees us as his redeemed, blood-washed, born-again, bought children of grace. And uh, every once in a while, it would do you well to take a, a look into the mirror of the Word of God, not just at the, the part where we need that we, 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 can, we get spoken of maybe in a context we think in a negative way, of course, is very positive, the Lord. And we just see the negative side of the reflection and fail to see that in the blood of Jesus and through the grace of God, we are different people, a, a, a really different people. So, yes, it's exceeding great cities, which is translated in some, most translation. But it has to do, I really believe, with the, with the compassion of God. And Jonah began to enter the city. Well, I've given you some study notes to your leader, and he'll talk about the size of the city uh, and, and how just how large that city was. It, it was massive. Uh, the, a lot of the liberal theologians and those who don't take the inerrancy of Scripture as reality will look at this and say, well, Nineveh was not that big a city. It was not three days' journey. Uh, as mentioned earlier, I said that Nineveh was in a time, the Assyrian kingdom was as a time of decline, uh, but it still was a massive complex. In fact, historians have proven, more recent archaeology uh, studies have shown that the, this was really the names of four component cities that were, it was like a regional, it was like four large primeval cities that were kind of housed behind one giant wall that was massive, you know, that uh, several chariots of breast could go across the top of it. As it said, the archaeology proves that this wall was at a hundred feet high at, at most of its places. Inside that was agricultural areas, gardens, or, you know, just uh, all kinds of things. The cities were called Nimrod, Co I'm sure I'm not even near pronouncing these right, Kojinjek, Kor Sabad, and Karamos. Uh, they would cover a distance of about three days' journey of walking and, and, and preaching about, if you took about 20 miles a day. But this greater Nineveh included all these things, all and probably most likely agricultural lands, which many cities did at that time and areas, because in times of battle, they not only wanted to be fortified, but they wanted to have their water and their agriculture available to them for any extended wars or any kind of extended sessions. But think about this, there's probably a million people in this region, and Jonah is preaching probably one of the greatest revivals that history has ever recorded, where God just supernaturally does this incredible thing. And he's preaching a message 40 days, and yet Nineveh will be uh, overthrown, or Nineveh will be destroyed. 
Uh, we looked at some of the notes you'll have from your leader there. I think that there's probably more to it, the message, than just this, those words. I believe it's a message where God is, uh, where probably most likely Jonah is sharing his testimony, a testimony which has probably already been heard abroad by the sailors who went back to the place in the city where all this trade would take place, where Joppa was. There, there, was, a, there was a crossroads for a lot, a lot of economy that was taking place. And then Jesus talks about that in Luke eleven twenty nine. He said, This is an evil generation. They seek a sign, and there shall be no sign given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For Jonah was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall the Son of Man be to this generation. So we can talk about Jonah's presence. Why was he a sign? Again, I believe his own testimony. I believe the testimony of the sailors who saw him drowned in the sea, swallowed by the well. And now here he is resurrected out of the well. He's most likely changed, obvious change of clothing from where he's from to the Ninevites clothing and the Syrians dress. But also I believe this bleach white presence that he had. Uh, he was a sight to behold, I'm sure. But, and, and he spoke to them, I believe, in a, in a message. I don't think we're reading between the lines when we talk about, you know, the testimony that he had, as well as the testimony that was probably had been heard by others about Jonah. So, it's, again, this is just a tremendous study as we get in the Word of God and we see how God brings revival. And one of the things I'd like to see in our discussion group today is we spend a little time talking about revival and how it happened and, and what brings about revival in our lives. Because I think we just get an overview here that God is willing to send re grace and mercy. If you look up Jeremiah 18, it's a verse you've heard me quote a lot of times in preaching in chapter verse 7 where it says where God says at what time I want to exalt a nation I'll exalt at what time I want to put down a nation I'll put down a nation the nation is a drop of bucket but then he goes on to say that if a nation will hear the word of God and repent that God will bring healing to that land so I would encourage you in your study look that up and maybe you spend a little discussion as you talk about revival today but here, here's Jonah. He appears. He is a startling sign, I believe, a bleach white prophet. Uh, and he begins to, 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 to talk about revival and judgment. I don't believe it's necessarily a, uh, a graceless message that he talks about judgment here. I just, I just think that it, it, when God told him, you speak the words that I tell you to speak, that there was more than just a few words here. I believe that God illuminated this prophet of God, that he preached the word of God as God instructed him to preach the word of God. And he's going throughout this, this city proclaiming truth, most likely start, uh, to the officials of the city, to the leaders of the communities, to the kings, the rulers, obviously to be part of hearing this message and to the general, the general populace as well. So much so that there's, there's such a, uh, a movement of the Spirit of God, which always is, has to be accompanying these moves of God, that there's this movement of the Spirit of God that prompts the people to come to the place of their senses. And we don't know just how long this, this revival happened. Obviously, later, I think under Nehemiah and Micah, we see a destruction that's pronounced from the Syrians. The, the tragedy with that revival was like a lot of revivals that have taken place in history, that it didn't pass down to the next generation that the people of the revival were not faithful to share with the next generation what God had done. Man, when you look in Psalm 78, I think that's what it is, where, the, where the David is, is speaking, and he says, you know, we must be faithful to tell our children and our children's children and the generations to come about the faithfulness of God and tell them of his signs and tell them of his wonders and telling of his miracles. And I think many times that is forgotten by one generation that experiences so much they forget to share that fully and completely with the next generation, not just in, in word, but in testimony, which is one of the beautiful things about Jonah's life. He's experienced already, you know, God's hand of dealing with him. And he now has called out from the belly of the well in repentance, all right? Or from Hades, that's a discussion from last week. I'll let y'all continue that, uh, that in, in that discussion. But he's experienced revival firsthand. Uh, I think when he hit the ground, uh, vomited up, he took a moment to collect his senses and dry off and head as lickety split as fast as he could for the Ninevites. But here he is. He's seen the grace of God. He's seen the power of God. He's seen this resurrected life experience of his own, the miraculous hand of God to change somebody's heart and mind. And now he goes a renewed man to speak to the Ninevites. Now we'll see in chapter four, you know, he's still got some grumbling and some issues uh, as we've talked about in chapter one. We'll go back and revisit those. 
And again, that just shows the faithfulness of God when he brings us back and starts dealing with us continually. Because just because we have experienced something from God doesn't mean that we have arrived at Grand Central Righteousness, all right? That that's the station, and now we've been glorified. No, we're continually learning. We're continually growing. We're continually having to be discipled as well as disciplined by the Lord so that we continue to go on. But here he is. He's experienced God, and he has a message, and I believe he's on fire with this message as he shares it. Let's learn how to be faithful with each and every generation to share the faithfulness of God with the next generation. Again, I put some stuff in our study notes for our lift leader to lead you through and to talk about and discuss uh, that you probably won't get through all of it, but there's a lot of good things. So be reading these passages, be praying before you get to lift, let God speak to your heart and then share, you know, and let's encourage one another during these times that we have together and minister one another. This is truly a body experience. That's what I love about our lift groups because they are a time when we can really, what we say is important and what we ask is important. So let's be open, let's be transparent, and let's see what God has for us. And let's experience revival like the Ninevites, just supernatural move of God in our hearts and lives. Amen. Hey, well, God bless you. I look forward to our chapter four as we get into it. Amen.